Good morning and afternoon. Welcome. As we're connecting here, everybody, if you want to unmute yourself and say good morning or afternoon too, anybody can, whoever they want to. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Quintet de Latinos webinar today. Good morning, everybody. Saludos todos. Hi, Ben. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Medina cohort. Saludos, Darwin. Hello, friends. Hello, Mary Garza. Saludos, Jose. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Ben. It's good to see everybody. Welcome, Margaret. Fernanda. Nicolas, it's good to see you. Hi, Katie. Thanks for coming, everybody. Hi, Sherry. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Armando. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Consuelo. Thanks for checking this out. Arturo, hey. Good morning. Good to see everybody. We'll just wait a few more seconds. And if you don't mind everybody muting yourself, because we're going to have these a few panelists be speaking. We don't have too many people talking all at the same time. That'd be great. Good morning, everybody. All right. Why don't we go ahead and just go ahead and launch in. It's great to see everybody. Thank you for coming. I want to do is just do a quick recognition of um, wherever any of us are in terms of um, our, our land, our indigenous land. If you know who your indigenous people are, uh, where I am in California, I am on the land of the Ohlone people. Um, if you don't, you can just know people of wherever you are all over the United States. Thanks for taking a moment to do that. My name is Armando Castellano. I'm just going to give, uh, I, I'm, we've been trying this thing where we give a visual introduction of who we are for anybody either who's on the phone or um, can't see in or watch their video off. Um, I am, just to describe what my screen is, I've got two doors behind me. I'm a six foot three. I have black hair, uh, brown skin and brown eyes. I'm wearing uh, glasses. I have, uh, uh, a pattern shirt on, and uh, I'm going to be hosting and um, today our panelists and for Quintetto Latino. Also joining with me are three um, panelists who are from our cohort, which I will talk about in a little bit. The first one is a good friend of mine, bassoonist, educator, uh, born in Honduras and lived her life, most of her life here in the United States. I first want to introduce Kika Wright. Go ahead and say hi, Kika. Good morning. Uh, my name is, uh, my name is Francisca del Carmen Wright and I go by Kika. Um, I am a five foot tall brown lady. I have big hair. It is black, I guess, I have brown eyes. I'm sitting in my living room. That is a poster of Tosca and my couch and a lamp. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, next, we have uh, my also my good friend Chaz Salazar, who is a flute player, uh, teaching artist, also a musical advocate. He's also a board member of Quinteto Latino. Go ahead, Chaz. Good morning, everyone. Yes, my name is Chaz Salazar. I have brown eyes, brown hair. I'm five six. I have a floral print shirt with different colored roses on it that reminds me of Selena como la flor and a big smile on my face. Uh, my pronouns are he, his. Thank you, Chaz. And I forgot to say my pronouns also are he and his. I Great. forgot to. Mine are she, her. Sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Kika. And, also, and, and we also have as our final panelist is Julian Hernandez, who is from Texas. And um, uh, Julian is a clarinetist um, who plays in another professional wind quintet. Um, and um, also he's a real estate agent and a fitness instructor. So welcome, Julian Hernandez. Hey everybody, my name is Julian. Um, it's good to see you all. Hey Margaret, good to see you. Um, my name is Julian, uh, six foot one, brown eyes, brown hair, uh, pronouns he, him, his. Um, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. 
Yay. So I'm just going to do a little introduction. So we'll get, just launch right in. My, my name is Armando Castellano. I'm the founder, director, and the French horn player of Quinteto Latino. Quinteto Latino is an arts organization with a chamber ensemble at its core. So we're a wind quintet, quintet that's been together for 17 years. Quinteto, Quinteto Latino focuses on a number of programming areas that impact Latinos in the United States. These include shining a light on inequities in our arts education system. Uh, we love sharing how Quinteto Latino develops and fosters diverse audiences. And of course, supporting Latino musicians and Latino composers. That's a core of what we do. Seminario is Quinteto Latino's flagship programming for supporting Latino musicians and composers. Seminario includes convenings around the country as well as uh, a mentoring, supporting, and leadership development. This summer, Quinteto Latino, um, and, and that seminario culminates in a summer institute where we bring together 20 professional Latino classical musicians together, also to build influence and power within the classical music field. This summer, Quinteto Latino um, tasked our 20 cohort um, of Latino musicians to answer the following questions. So we spent two days in the summer answering this, these questions. What can classical music field do to better support Latinos? We talked about what can the field of classical music better do better to engage and retain Latino musicians, to engage and retain Latino staff, Latino board members, and Latino leadership. And ultimately- Here, where are you going? What can the field of class? Oh, did, did well, you I need my wallet. Better? And, oh, if you're not muted, go ahead and mute yourself, anybody. We represent Latino Those musicians and Latino composers. Now, before I'm going to try to get but, everyone muted, except me, Adriana, you're going to find, I think Mark is, uh, needs muting. See if you can find them, Adriana. Okay, so before we start sharing from our panelists, I want to see who is in the room here today. So in the chat, so get your get on your keyboard, click into your chat, okay? I want you to say whatever you want to say about yourself. So you can say your name, where you're from, go ahead and start doing this. Are you in a chamber ensemble? You know, you can say that, or do you want to say if you're in an orchestra? Are you a student? Um, are you a presenter? Are you an artist, a funder? Um, are you on the staff or a board member of an organization? Are you a music ed educator, artist, policy specialist? So let's go ahead all and populate that. Um, uh, uh, and and thank you for sharing your native lands too. All right. Um, pop, go ahead and put in what what um, your chosen uh, um, what how you want to tell tell us about yourself a little about your story, your name if you want where you're from geographically. We've already been sharing about our native lands, which is beautiful. And I love seeing all those names and all those wonderful um, uh, native titles that we have there. Just, uh, it just shows uh, that we're born of diversity and, and the diversity that we have in this room too. Uh, you, uh, are you a musician, presenter, funder, board member? You just love classical music or you just care about Latino identity? Maybe you're related to one of us on the panel or somebody in there. <laughs> Maybe you're a friend of the family. I see some of my friends of my parents and our family here on this call too, which is really fun. And please look through, see um, uh, who is in our audience and, and who's here and what they care about and what their fields are and who's interested in this topic. You know, who in the field is, is interested in talking about Latino, Latinos and classical music? Thanks for doing that. Who's in the room? Um, I, I, you know, I'm going to, I do this thing when I go to webinars and when I'm on calls that I'm always looking for other Latino names because there's so few of us. And when they're there, I always chat them up and I say hi, I check them out on social media. And that's how I build my network and of other Latino musicians. It's a lot of the ways I found some of the cohorts in Quinta Latino here today, just to find other brown faces in the field. Because it's so rare. It's so rare. We have a lot of them here, but it's pretty rare in classical music. Okay. Um, 
Now, uh, before we dive into our subjects about Latino and classical music, I want to provide a, an important framing for us. Quinteto Latino and our cohort of 20 musicians from Sem Seminario made some baseline assumptions about our field. And this webinar is for partners in the field that agree with these baseline assumptions. Okay, so I want to just say, you know, this is like the you go to um, uh, you're in college and you go to Psych 101 and they say, okay, this is Psych 101 by uh, um, uh, uh, taught by so and so. And if you're not if you're not supposed to be in this class, then you should go. You should leave now. This is the same thing. I'm gonna do some framing, some baseline assumptions about this conversation, and this is. This is um, where, what we're going to start with as an organization and as a cohort. First of all, the first baseline assumption is that, um, that, that racism does exist in our field. Racism exists in our classical music field. That's our first line, baseline assumption. The second thing that's framing for this conversation is um, We all understand that classical music field is not a meritocracy. That is that not all of our decisions are based on merit, solely on talent. The fact is that if you are white and in this field, you have an advantage. It is not a meritocracy. And the third baseline assumption, and I think this is probably the most important, is that as a system, we believe we can change these things. And today we're gonna to talk about how we can do that. So those are our baseline assumptions for this conversation. And we welcome partnerships with those assumptions in mind. So we hope you stay with us today and join in this fight for equity in our field. Okay, the webinar has two parts today. The first one is gonna be about Latino identity. And the second part is gonna be our call to action to the field and our challenge to the field about what they can do better to serve and retain Latinos. We're going to take some questions and reflect on comments from all of you. So throughout the webinar, when you have a question, when you have a comment, please put it in any time. And we're going to be keeping an eye on those and looking out for them. If you have anything you want to say or a question, please type it in any time. One of us is calling all that information and we're going to try to make comments and questions, answer questions and make comments on that at the end. So please, Put your questions there about something you want to know or something based on what we're saying. Okay, so the first is about, a first section of our webinar is about identity and Latino identity, Latinx identity, Hispanic identity, all those words that so many people ask me and wonder about, what does all that mean? How do I navigate that when I'm trying to partner with Latinos? So this is what the section is about and this is what the cohort in Seminario wanted us to talk about. So um, the first thing we're going to do is I want everybody on the call to put in what you see your identity as. Okay, I'm going to do it too. So the first question for the chat is, and please chat to everyone, is how you identify Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, white, mixed race, something else. Don't want to say, go ahead and start doing that. I'm going to type in mine. I'm going to put in, there's so many, I, I go back and forth between so many. I'm putting in Latino and Latinx. I think those are the ones I'm gonna choose. And you put in yours, whatever they are. You, this is not just for Latinos, by the way. So just whatever you wanna put. It's a safe place to do that. There's no, and there's not, what, what I love about this question, everyone can answer it. And um, everyone gets to choose their own word all the time. Even in Seminario, everyone chose their own word for how they wanna identify themselves, you know? All right, and check out some of this wording because if you if there's some words there you don't know or have questions about, you know, it's a good time to see. All right, we're gonna go uh, to our first panelist here to talk uh, about, Lat who's gonna do our first introduction about Latino identity. Kika, can you go ahead and get started, please? Thank you. Hi, thanks again. Um, so to answer your question, I will identify myself as mixed race. Um, it's not even, you know, like I am, descended from enslaved persons from West Africa and indigenous Hondurans and Western European people. So it's not even as easy to say, you know, I'm biracial or I'm, because I am Latina, but I feel like it's like so much more than that. So that was something that the cohort that we all talked about together was that um, 
we are as Latinos, we're ident we are united by our identity, culture, and our history. And just like kind of as a reminder, Latino refers to everybody who is from Mexico and South. And that includes, you know, and it also like the definition changes as like the times change. But um, to me, that includes people from uh, Suriname, you know, uh, Guyana, the Caribbean. Uh, it's almost, it's like almost half a billion people. It's hundreds of languages. Um, and so it does sometimes feel like Latino is not the best word to describe everybody, but we do have a lot of things in common, like I said, our history, our culture, and our, our identity. And so um, not all of us speak Spanish. There are people who grew up in Latin America, have been there their whole entire lives, who've never spoken a one single word of Spanish or Portuguese or Dutch. So it's like so many things that make us different, but also like, you know, geographically, we're all the same. Thank you, Kika. Julian, what, um, uh, what are you going to share with us about Latino identity? Hi, everyone. So, um, yeah, I am a Latino, a Puerto Rican descent. Um, I also identify as queer, so that um, adds another layer of fun for everyone. <laughs> um, but I did want to mention that a lot of people put us in the same boiling pot, um, and it's it's kind of troubling for a number of reasons. Um, we, we kind of want everyone to know, I, but let me backtrack. I first want to say that reading everyone's um, chat right now is kind of, is really inspiring. And it's yeah. um, just all of you being here is really already feels like a huge step in the right direction. So thank you. Um, anyway, I did, I, um, what we wanted to share from the cohort earlier this summer is that our opinions and our existence and our presence is all valid. Um, all too often we get written off just because we struggle to find the right words or we're not as eloquent and um, we can't um, use communications to um, share our opinions. But as long as you are actively listening, um, we can move forward. I think active listening is the real key here. Um, English may not be our first language, it may be our second or third or our fourth, and um, we wanted people to understand that before dismissing our voices and our ideas. And like Kika mentioned, not all of us speak Spanish. Assume, assuming all of us can dance or are spicy or what have you is <laughs> problematic in, in a lot of ways, and this only feeds into you know, the subtle bias that we all have and the generalizing idea that we are all the same and we are truly not, just like we have mentioned before. It's great subtle bias, stereotyping us, um, and, and how that affects uh, people's perceptions of us. Thank you. We got Chaz, Latino identity. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. Um, the One of the issues that we've all faced as Latinx, Latina, Latino people is colorism. And I think it's worth defining. Uh, colorism is prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone, typically among people of the same ethnic or racial group. We Latinxes, Latinas, and Latinos come in all shades. We are not just one color. Understanding the spectrum of colorism and how those of us who are darker skinned have less access and privilege than those of us who are lighter skinned is important. Um, as you can see there, we are all different shades on the panel ourselves, just among us four. Mm -hmm. uh, I invite all of us to use our privileges, whatever they may be, to lift up those who are more disenfranchised and more marginalized than, than ourselves. Thank you, Chaz. You know, um, in terms of my own uh, talking point on this, something that I have experienced and, and, and I share specifically as someone who's been in the chamber music field for two decades and including taking leadership positions nationally and touring and book being in presenters conferences and with other presenters and uh, 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 around the country um, that, that not all Latino musicians are folk musicians and jazz musicians. Okay. This is a gross, Gross stereotype, I encounter it constantly. Latino musicians and composers do make art music. We do play classical music. In fact, much of the classical and contemporary music made by Latino composers sounds like all other classical and contemporary music. Not all Latino composers write with a Latin flavor that's already been mentioned here. Latino composers write music that comes from who they are, just like any other composer. When I talk in the field about Quinteto Latino, 
my professional win quintet, there is too often a stereotype that we are playing salsa or merengue or banda or cumbias or mariachi. And the reality is that the music we play in the field as a classical music chamber ensemble that only plays Latino composers in wind quintets and is written by Latino composers, it sounds like all other classical and contemporary music. It's of the same ilk and the same quality and of the same genre, okay? And these stereotypes, I feel, often leave us having to explain and spend more time trying to explain and sell ourselves. It's a big, it's an issue for us. It's something we hold on our back and have to hold for other people and other communities, these stereotypes. Okay, that's the end of our first section on the webinar. Again, please put comments or questions in the chat that you have. If anything is coming, a concern, a sadness, a feeling, please put it in the chat because we are going to be looking at this at the end and try to answer some of those questions and specifics that are in the chat. So um, the next section we're moving on to is, is our Quintato Latino 2020 Summer Cohort Seminario Call to Action. Uh, it's a charge to the field or call to action. What does classical music as a field need to do better to serve Latinos? to retain and support Latinos? How can we as a field better engage with and retain Latino musicians, with Latino staff? How do we engage and retain Latino board members and Latino leadership? And how do all of us in classical music more authentically represent Latino musicians and composers authentically, okay? All right, so we're gonna start with Kika on this first part of our call to action, where she's gonna talk about music segregation and gatekeeping. Go ahead, um, Kika, thank you. Thank you. So uh, it was very inspiring to participate in the seminario a uh, couple, was it in July, it feels like, <laughs> who knows, time. Anyway, um, it was really cool to gather with other Latino musicians. I see some of them here and I would just say, it's, I miss you guys a lot, I hope we can talk soon, but um, we were discussing things that we wanted the field to know about, and the first thing that we wanted to talk about was uh, musical segregation and gatekeeping and finding a way to eliminate those things. Um, in this political and social moment of racial reckoning, there has never been a better time, and people have never been more motivated to solve these problems. Uh, so what is musical segregation? Musical segregation is any circumstance where everyone looks the same, went to the same schools, is from like generally the same socioeconomic background. Um, just as like a thought experiment, I encourage you to Google the demographics of your hometown and then look up the roster of the biggest arts organization and just kind of see if the roster of the arts organization matches the demographics of the people that live in your community. I love that challenge. <laughs> I love that challenge. Sorry. I do my... it. I mean, I can, uh, if anybody wants to, I've done it, you know, I can talk about that for, I for do hours. Too. We, all, we all do it as people yeah. of color. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, the second thing is gatekeeping in the uh, classical music industry. Uh, gatekeeping is any action that is designed to prevent people from coming in. For instance, it is hard to get invited to an audition when you haven't studied with a prominent teacher or you haven't attended a prestigious school. And as an industry, we have decided that we have a stratified system of like which composers are more important than the others. And we have decided that dead white European men are more important, they are at the top. And then poor non-white young composers, oftentimes women are at the bottom. And we all, myself included, have upheld this stratified system and now is a great time for us to examine why and try to stop. Uh, the next thing is ageism. Ageism is an impediment to true diversity. Um, just in my own life, I will say I went to a music festival and I had a roommate that lied about her age so that she could be treated like a young prodigy instead of, you know, a very talented 27 year old. She was pretending to be like an astronomically skilled 22 year old and so that happens and i understand why she did it because we value you know the prodigy and we value youngness and we should value quality and we should value like good art instead of you know flashy <laughs> you know um 
like, wow, this 13 year old can play the violin, you know. Um, due to the lack of access to robust and low cost or free music education, a lot of people from these low in resource communities get a later start in music and they shouldn't be penalized for that. And I know Chaz is gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, and how do we solve all of these problems? Uh, it comes with like decolonizing and destratifying our repertoire, music theory, music history, and the pieces that we perform and just try to better reflect the identities of the people that are coming to see our concerts and the students that we're teaching. Um, so imagine if a youth orchestra had a season where they only played music that was written by people in the region. Or and imagine the connections that you would form the players themselves to the region and the audience to a person who wrote the music that is their neighbor. So, um, or music from the Americas, we all live in the Americas, wouldn't it be cool to hear a season of music that was just from, yeah, our neighbors, the people that wrote music that's born of a similar exp lived experience to ours. So those are things that we talked about in the cohort. Thank, thanks, oops. Oh yeah, I'm on. thank you, Kika. Uh, um, and so much of that resonates with me. I'm, I have been mentoring Latino musicians for two decades and all of that is like by far impacts all of them so so often the repeated story um, okay Chaz what what our second call to action absolutely um, one recurring theme that we kept coming back to in seminario was access to music education um, I'm going to start right off the bat with the action item itself this central action item that that can be done um, and it is to use your resources and contacts to create a pipeline fund to invest in creating equitable opportunities for BIPOC students, especially at the entry point of kids into music. We all know that studying music is expensive. Having this kind of fund helps BIPOC students and gives them the access to the tools needed to study and benefit from music, such as private lessons, instruments, supplies, scholarships, transportation, and all the other parts of music that cost money. These kinds of tools are needed throughout the trajectory of a BIPOC student's musical pathway, and you can help at any juncture of their development. One important organizational partner is the youth orchestra, the local youth orchestra. Partner with them and see what support systems can be put in place for BIPOC students and musicians and how you and your organization can provide them, provide those resources and for those BIPOC students that come after them. Uh, also along this pathway of studying music, BIPOC educators, mentors, and leaders must be engaged at the forefront of our efforts. Find us and hire us. We provide cultural competence and understanding to a different degree than our white counterparts. And not having a role model who looks like us and represents our culture and cultural background affects BIPOC students more than we think. So I wanna tell you about my individual story um, in music and, and how a role model and a program made it possible for me today. Uh, my musical journey began at Valley View Elementary School, a Title I school in South Phoenix in Arizona. My band director was Mr. Gaona. He was also Chicano, just like me. He saw me. He understood me, my background, my family's background. He knew that we couldn't afford lessons. So he referred me to Rosie's House. Rosie's House is a music academy that provides free lessons to under-resourced youth. I took free lessons there until high school graduation. If it wasn't for Mr. Gaona, a brown man who understood my struggles and who understood my culture and who believed in me, I wouldn't be on this call today. If it wasn't for him referring me and suggesting that I go to Rosie's house, I also wouldn't be here. And if Rosie's house didn't exist, the program that provided me lessons, scholarships and opportunities, I wouldn't be on this call today. So I'll say it again, use your resources and contacts to create a pipeline fund to invest in creating equitable opportunities for BIPOC students, especially those students at the beginning entry point of music, right? Because if we don't um, have students getting exposure and studying music from the beginning, from that exposure point, how are they then gonna get into the youth orchestra, then go to college to study music, then audition for, for professional orchestras and performing ensembles? 
Um, one other, well, two other call to action items that came out of Seminario were one, give every student at a Title I school access to high caliber music education, and two, advocate for music and the arts to be part of the core K-12 curriculum. Now, these two suggestions highlight how deeply embedded these systemic issues are in our society and how we must catalyze the change. Awesome, thank you, Chaz. You know, that the, I want to remind everybody, first of all, that the things that we are saying came from a cohort of 20 professional classical musicians who are Latinos that they discuss for two days. And this is, we, Quintet Latino creates a space where that, that, that I believe does not exist in classical music in the US, where Latino, other brown folks can sit down with other Latinos and talk about these important issues that impact us and our systems that we live and thrive in. And, 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 and they're based on inequities that we've experienced ourselves in our own life experiences. Um, I want to just mention some, keep putting comments in the, in, the, um, in the chat. We are looking out for those. We're looking for themes in there. So this is something awesome I'm already seeing too, is that people, other Latinos on this call are giving resources to people with questions on this call. Latinos can be a resource to your organization. When you ask and listen, you can, you can um, uh, learn and partner authentically. That's already happening on this chat. I love that that we're already sharing resources and sharing where to find and solving problems together here. And I love that we can, be, this conversation can be a bridge between communities and with Latinos. Okay, the next thing, uh, our third call to action is what I'm calling, who is in charge? True diversity starts at the top. Who is in charge? Who's on your board? What does your leadership look like? In order to create more diverse organizations and serve diverse audiences and pro groups, we first need to look at who is in charge. This is something that Kika mentioned. She was saying like Google the, the um, diversity of the community you're sitting in and Google the diversity of the, of the orchestra, real orchestra and see the differences. Who's in charge? Is our staff representing the communities we want to serve? Does our board culturally and racially reflect the communities we care about? Who is the making the decision in our organizations? We need to seek out and have board members and staff, especially executive staff, who are socially, historically, and culturally informed and value the changes we want to see in the field. Who is in charge? There's a part two to this who is in charge issue. And that is, once we have more diverse organizations, we have people of color in these power positions, executive staff, people of color in the board members as musicians, are we prepared to listen to them? Are we prepared to hear voices that have not traditionally been served in the field? Are we ready to empower more diverse opinions and ideas? Empower, that's, this is a big step. It does, it's one step to have them there. It's another step to actually empower and listen to them. Are we ready to step down and lead by more diverse and be led by more diverse voices? It's an open question. I mean, this is about self-reflection as well. It's not just in, in bringing them on. It's like, how do I change myself and the way I hear and listen to people of color and people who have not traditionally been a part of my organization potentially? I want to tell a story about Quinteto Latino and our board of directors. In the field, I am constantly asked, how can I find Latinos to be on, on my board? I can't find any. How do I find Latinos with the capacity and skill set needed for the board, for my board? Quinteto Latino has a board, has a board of seven members, and six of them are Latinos. We have a college professor, a philanthropist, a professional musician. We have someone who's young. We have a manager at a national presenter. We have an international presenter of chamber music. We have a local print, uh, instruct, piano instructor. We have LGBTQ representation. It is possible to find highly skilled Latinos to sit on our boards. I did it. It wasn't even that hard. 
And I have a theory that perhaps Quinteto Latino is the first national professional performing arts organization in classical music with an 85% Latino board. Let me know if you know of any others, because I'm I just like, I want, I want to hear from, from the field at large. Okay, one more. This is our last part of our call to action. Julian is going to uh, talk next. Go ahead, Julian. Thank you, Armando. Um, I did want to echo what somebody said in the chat on the side. I think it was from Carol. Um, she said the whole audition process for professional orchestras is unhealthy. Musicians playing skills should be paired with their collaborative skills, interest in building relationships with community, willingness to work with children, especially those without resources should be part of the audition, not merely playing prowess. Wow. I think we can end the call here. <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I think that is, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking back to my own personal experience joining, um, WinSync, the Win Quintet of which I am currently a part. Um, the audition process involved a whole week. It wasn't just a day where I was behind a screen playing quintet repertoire. I had to do a master class. They had to see me teach. I had to do um, rehearsal with them. I had to rehearse with them. It wasn't just a performance. I had to rehearse with them. They had to see if I was a collaborator as much as I was a performer and artist. And there was also, which I think was the most important aspect of the audition process was the hangout session where we just went out to get dinner after. And they got to see who I was, you know, when I let my hair down and took off my jacket and to see who I was as a person. Cause I think, um, you know, you have to respect your colleagues on a personal level as well as a musical level. Um, anyway, so yeah. So like I said before, active listening is the key component here. Um, we are not asking for special treatment. We are simply asking to be at the table, to be in the same room where those important decisions are being made. Um, you know, to be a part of the conversation is huge. Um, we're at a point um, in this day and age where being an ally is no longer enough. We first need empathy, a call to action, and finally we need decisions being made. And like Armando said, what does your board look like? Look at the faces. Do those members reflect the community or do they, you know, do they truly have the community's best interests at heart or just how big their pockets can get with that season? Um, and just like Chaz mentioned about every student um, having access, every student in the Title I school should have this access to music education. Um, and what is a Title I school for those of you not in the US? It is um, where 75% of the students qualify for free or reduced lunch. Um, so yeah, after school music programs in place of daycare, we need to hire professional musicians to come and educate um, those young minds and we cannot um, emphasize this enough music programs need to be funded in every school um, additionally music needs to remain a core subject you know um, now there is a push to the stem idea which science technology engineering and math are the only subjects that matter and um, i i think we need to keep art in those subjects so stem to steam art does belong with those fields and and the test statistics don't lie, you know, students involved in the arts do exceedingly well on standardized exams. Um, additionally, every performing organization needs to do more run out concerts. You know, not just having it in their own concert hall space and inviting people to the community doing free concerts in your concert hall isn't enough. You need to go out there into the community, meet them in their space at their level. Um, yeah, to that effect, we need to try and provide funding to bus parents and families to these concert halls if you want to have these free concerts for the community. Um, like I said, it's not enough. We need to get them here, bus the parents, bus the families to the concert halls to experience it. This may be the first time they go downtown to see the big symphony, you know what I mean? And um, on the topic of seeing the local symphony, I think we need to readjust our idea of what it means to be inclusive of all composers. And so programming white Eurocentric composers with pieces um, featuring Spanish or Hispanic flares, it does not count. You know, we are not caricatures. Um, just because you seemingly checked off the diversity box in your organization by including that one piece on your program during Black History Month, or you bring in mariachis for Cinco de Mayo, it's not enough on our end. Um, it's like a big swing and a miss, honestly. Every concert needs to include pieces by people of color, female, uh, female POCs, queer POCs. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and again, to, to reiterate, there, there is um, a troubling um, lack of Hispanic and Black musicians, not because of culture or upbringing, simply because of access. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, everybody. 
Um, it's been in, it's been a really nice call. Some really active chat. I really appreciate it. This is the end of our first and second portions of our webinar. Um, we talked about uh, Latino identity, and we shared what this cohort, some summer's Quinteto Latino Seminario cohort of Latino musicians feels is um, that the, our field needs to do better. To and now we want to um, have a little discussion and and look at some of the things that were brought up in the chat. And um, I, I wanted to do just an additional poll. First of all, there's a, a number of uh, folks here on this call that are from that participated in Seminario, Latino musicians, and I just want to see your presence. So, can anybody who was in Seminario wave your hand and just so they can see? We can see who came to Seminario. We have some Quintato Latino musicians here too. Good, it's good to see everybody. Thank you for coming to this call. And um, and and so you can see that there is a lot of Latino musicians. What they're thinking about. I know when I'm going to an organization and I'm often the only one playing an orchestra who's Latino. These the these issues come to mind for me. Okay, so um, I just want to give, uh, have um, Vince Dominguez is Quinteto Latino's communications uh, person. Yes, give uh, a shout out for Vince. And he's also was a seminar participant. He's a clar professional clarinetist, currently living in um, uh, Rhode Island. And Vince has been keeping an eye on the chat with some questions. Um, and Vince, can you, um, either name out some themes or some questions you saw or call someone out to ask a question. Thank you. Sure, of course. Hi everyone, my name is Vince Dominguez. Uh, thank you everyone who's spoken so far. I think we're getting a lot done today. Hope everyone's enjoying the webinar so far. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, the first is from someone named Catherine Little. She said, do others find that boards at organizations with more state and government financial support have more diverse parentheses, ethnically, age-wise, skill sets, et cetera, parentheses, than those organizations for which boards are a major source of the financial safety net. Can we, can we, ha can we have Catherine? this in the chat, just so everyone can see it again. Can we have Catherine uh, just talk a little bit about her question herself? Was it Catherine? Hi there, I'm Catherine Little. Thank you, Catherine. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me as part of this session today. It's been really eye-opening for me and, um, I really appreciate hearing lots of echoes and completely different experiences from my own arts education. So thank you for, for all of that. Um, yeah, the, the root of my question is sort of linked with, I think that we all find that the barriers of entry to the arts happen you know, so early on. I think the other set of the barriers to entry also happen where organizations are struggling with, okay, well, how do we keep the lights on and how do we maintain financial support? And often there's less diversity among those who have you know, the widest donorship um, you know, responsibilities in our companies. And as a genuine question from those of different organizations, I've worked primarily in higher education and professional opera companies where, um, you know, admittedly, that is largely the algorithm, you know, where the boards are less diverse, but they're also a higher portion of the financial stability of the company. So for those of you who have, you know, maybe different experiences from mine, I'm wondering if you find that when a company has a more um, healthy, well-rounded portfolio of financial support, if that frees up the board to be a little bit more diverse because there isn't that tie to, well, you have to donate at this level every year all the time. I, I can jump into that question. I sit on four boards nationally and, and, and do um, you know, uh, consulting at this level of leadership. And, um, I think I'm gonna, uh, some things that come up from, to my mind in, in answering this question. One is that most of the funders of classical music are going and most of philanthropists in general are white. And they're funding people and organizations that look and sound like them. 1% of philanthropic dollars in the United States go to Latino serving institutions, 1%. That means that in general, when an organization is led by mm -hmm. white folks, they're given more money, they're trusted, generally trusted more, they're asked to do less for that money, and um, they're given uh, more freedom to do, that means more general operations fund. Just in general, the numbers play out in terms of who's leading an organization. And often, so they're already so, um, uh, the, the, because those the it, traditionally in the U.S., those are the wealthier folks 
the um, white board members in general, and they are the um, traditionally seen as the philanthropists, that that is the case, they tend to be healthier organizations. Does that, if the board decides they want to welcome more diverse leadership, I have found that doesn't necessarily equal less money. It doesn't. And that's a, a, a stereotype around people. I sit on four boards and I'm a big donor on all those boards. So um, um, I, I know that there are people like me do exist and they're out there. I have them on my board as well. I hope I, hope I was able to answer a little bit of your question. Catherine, thank you so much. Vince, is there another question that you can, you can pull from the chat? Well, I just wanted to also mention, okay. I put the, I put an article from the New York Times in the chat about it because I talk about this a lot funding and also I write a lot of grants and I do a lot of like crowdfunding and fundraising for smaller organizations. And it is a statistical fact that um, black and brown led organizations get like astronomically less institutional support from organizations like I read a study that said, um, you know, the big, the the biggest like funder of black and brown institutions uh, was the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation they give a lot of money to Sphinx organizations, so they do like, you know, they have like that, I guess, you know, imperative. But of all the money that they gave out, only thirty five percent of their funding went to black and brown organizations, which means that sixty five percent of their funding went to. Um, white led organizations and so you know like so it's just I mean it is it's just like just generally harder for us to get money because people think that we because we're black and brown people will just be like less responsible with I don't know I don't know thanks Kika okay Vince is there another question Go ahead. yes uh who's gonna who's that uh, this is from Barbara Scales, and she writes, what about composers? Are there great catalogs or collections of Latino composers which promote their works in a valuable way? What more can we do to make these composers household names? Bar Barbara, are you still on the call? Can you, can you, there you are. Go ahead, Barbara. Hi, yeah. Um, I've been working as an artist manager for almost 40 years, and the thing that brought me into the field is my desire to help people open their hearts to the works of composers they've never heard of and to help those composers find the ears that will embrace them. So um, uh, I am working with Gabriela Ortiz, who is a Mexican composer who has had some really extraordinary success, but not nearly the success that she merits, perhaps because she's Mexican, perhaps because she's a woman, but not because she's timid in any way, or ungifted. So, um, so, you know, but she's not the only composer I know from Latin America. There are many and they're wonderful. What's your, qu your question is about more, you want to find Latino composers or why I want to, I want to, no, I want to find ways to help promote them. I'm also the board chair of the Canadian Music Center in Quebec. And, right. you know, that's a commitment I have to helping to promote Quebec and Canadian composers. But I, I think, I know I've worked with the Latin American Music Center at Indiana University. I suspect that there are other places where right. music is cataloged or stored in the oh, United so the, States. The question is about how to find them or how to promote them? How to promote them. Well, how people, how musicians can find them and how musicians and the rest of us can promote them. Great. Thank you. Does anybody want to, Chaz or Kika or Julian? I'm happy to answer too. Um, well, I would just say like, uh, so I, you, so you work at Canadian Music Center. I went to school at Glen Gould School and I use the Canadian okay. Music Center like all day, every day. And I just like, oh my gosh. So yeah. but some, that is a good model. Like Canadian Music Center, when you go to school in Canada, you have to play a piece by a Canadian composer on your recital, which is something that no, I, any school in America doesn't do. And so because of that imperative, I mean, that is one way to get a high quality recording of a piece by, you know, even if you're like, oh, uh, you know, Curtis is in Pennsylvania. So every Curtis student has to play a piece by a Pennsylvanian. 
like the only like but that's what I would say like we need to we need to have like I mean yeah like um like Barbara said there is like a Latin American music center um at IU yeah. at IU and like maybe I need to I didn't know about that before today okay. and <laughs> so I'm learning a lot okay so anyway that's what I would say thank you great hello Sorry if I can jump in. Oh, Darwin, we're going to, okay, really fast, okay. Darwin, okay? No, very quick, very quick. Um, I know your, your feeling. I didn't know of this institute before either, so uh, just knew by now. But I we have, at my foundation, we have been working actually by trying to find more Latino music and just promoting them in our website. So maybe we can just talk. I, I will talk to you on the on the chat, so just to keep it quick. I'm, I'm going to re, uh, re, go back to my other answer in terms of power, or who's in the room, who's making the decisions, who are we involving in the programming, what do they look like, are they reflecting the communities that we want to perform, who are we asking. I have to say I get a repertoire question at least weekly, at least. I could start a whole other organization to serve institutions that want to find Latino composers. I am not at capacity to do that. I'm not. It's a huge issue, but it's only the entry point to this issue. For me, the issue is who is in power? Who is making the decision? Who are we evolving? Who are we hiring? What do those people look like? What cultural identities are they from? And when I do that, when you involve those folks, naturally, I believe the repertoire evolves from that. But it does, I really appreciate this question. I love getting those questions. I love pointing people towards Kayamba's music. And of course, Quinta Latino does lots of commissioning ourselves. And we're really focusing this in on uh, trying to hone in on non-straight cisgendered male composers. A majority of the music we have played has been that. We're focused, I'm really trying to focus on people who identify themselves uh, from the LGBT community or on, on the identity spectrum currently, because I feel like those are the voices I really want to empower more than ever. Can we do one more question, Vince? Do you have something? Just name the person yeah. and we'll have them answer, ask the question. Yeah. One more question, and this is, is from Sherry Frumpkin. But Sherry, can you unmute yourself and would you mind just saying a little something? We just have a few more minutes. Thank you, Barbara, for asking that, okay? I really yeah. appreciate you. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, because we're in this sort of uh, very innovative stretch, um, you know, both technically, the whole virtual reality, you know, what can, how can, we leverage this very unique time that we're in where people are being a little more thoughtful and uh, and reach out. You know, as, as I've listened to all these conversations, I, I feel ashamed. You know, we're very white. You know, our organization is, our musicians are, our board is. You know, how can I impact that change? And, you know, is it a matter of like, okay, we'll find someone Latinx to put on our board and we'll make sure more musicians, you know, I don't think that's the right approach, but what, what can I do, you know, personally during this time uh, to make change, to help make change within our own organization? Thank you. Anybody in our panel want to grab that? I I would, I would say, as, as again, as some, someone who does consulting around these issues with white-led and white-serving organizations, it is a, um, diversity is not cheap. It's not, we, to write, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of wrongs is, is, it's very time consuming. It's an emotional process. It, um, it's, it, it takes a whole village coming together. It, it, and it's not a single, it's not one single steps, it's a bunch of big steps. And so, um, so uh, I, I think, uh, you know, leadership is a great way to start um, uh, uh, and, and, and repertoire and musicians having just having a, I, I've done workshops where I just, we just talked, we just like named and talked about race because people had never done that before. You know, just to do that, just to have a discussion about it and where our entry point is to that discussion. It has to start somewhere. And um, yeah, that, that, would, that would be my answer. It's not, it's, I, I wish I had like a magic wand or some simple, you know, tool. Anybody else want to say anything from our panel? Shall I just there? wanted to say um, and echo that, that this, this fixing these wrongs, 
you know, of hundreds and hundreds of years, right? It's actually going to be a full collective effort of all of us coming together. And again, yeah, it's not going to be cheap. You know, it, bit, the ways that you can do it, um, there's ways that you can do it without funding, but but the majority of that work needs to be done with the funding. It's just a matter of of, of funding. You know, it's a big part of the money. And um, but ways that you can do it without funding is literally be an activist for us BIPOC musicians. Say, as we said in the chat, say our names, promote us, uh, do everything you can so people know who we are. That's without funding. And with funding, which is which is what, what really is the big part of it because of the imbalance of wealth in the U.S., right? This is a societal issue. It's not just in classical music, right? Classical music is a microcosm in the society that we live in. Of course, with this elitist nature, it, it reflects that society. We want it to actually serve as an example as opposed to just reflecting the systemic oppression, systemic racism, and so forth. So, of course, that, that, that's a big issue. And this is what I mean about these deeply embedded systemic issues. But every way you can, approach it at all angles as much as you can, though, right? It's not one person doing it. It's all of our collective efforts, all of us. Thank you, Chaz. Thanks, Chaz. You know, we, we, are, we are at the hour. You know, obviously, this is just touching on, on, on these very intense subjects and we are going to have Quintetal is going to have more webinars and be touching on this more often this season this is one of the opportunities we have in our covid and you know uh, uh online time uh before i go uh, i want to thank our funders which includes sphinx and power fund and kayambis music and the california arts council um i also um want to uh, uh let you know that we are going to put in our next newsletter our call to action and our thoughts on latino identity so you will be getting a written version of what we talked about today in our newsletter so if you want if you want to see it in writing just sign up for our newsletter at our website or just go ahead and put your email in the chat we'll be happy to add you to our newsletter and to stay in touch uh, a couple of shout outs I want to give definitely is that uh, my, my Quinteto Latino musicians here, the, my other familia of Diane Gruby and Leslie and Sean Jones, who've been playing Latino composers for 17 years, almost two decades of us together. We have been seeing each other for 17 years, sitting next to each other. It's, it's amazing. And um, the other, other, I really want to thank Chaz and uh, Julian and Kika for committing themselves to this work in this webinar. So thank you. Thanks to the three of you for having us. Um, our staff uh, is here, Adriana and Vince and, um, and Andrea Temkin. Can okay, you shout out to them? Also, it's just nice to see some other new faces that, uh, that I've been here in this work on this call. And I really look forward to uh, staying in touch with everybody. I'm sorry we couldn't have a deeper discussion. I appreciate you joining us for this first discussion and, and, and getting these questions, sharing about Latino identity, hearing about our call to action for the field. And we hope to see you on the next one, okay? So everybody, thank you so much, all right? And um, please stay in touch on social media or here, okay? Thank you, thank you everybody for coming.